Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and today I'd like to talk about one week in November, specifically the first week of November 1957. On that week, something really extraordinary happened. It was a very intense UFO wave, unlike anything the Earth has experienced before or since. It was truly unprecedented. Uh, this wave of sightings actually involved landings and a huge, huge number of car stalling cases, cases in which the vehicle's engine and headlights become affected by the close presence of a UFO. Uh, it's a really extraordinary case, uh, multiple cases really. It caused a lot of concern at very high levels of military and government. It really changed the way people viewed UFOs forever and uh, is often said to be isolated to the Leveland, Texas area and parts of New Mexico. It's a very well-known case. You've probably heard of it. But what most people don't know is it's far more intense than that. It's uh, actually worldwide. It wasn't just in Leveland, Texas and uh, near White Sands, New Mexico. Uh, this took place all over the world. And this first week of November involved 50, 100 cases of UFOs stalling cars and actually having an effect on a wide variety of machines, vehicles, and instruments. So something was clearly going on here. And uh, that's what kind of really draws me to this case to try to figure out why is this week so different from anything that's ever happened in UFO history before or since? So yeah, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, you know, car stalling cases do reach back to the 1940s at least. And uh, so they've been known by UFO investigators for years and years, but nothing like this. I mean, this is truly incredible. The first real hint of the upcoming wave, perhaps, occurred on October 16th, this 1957, when a lady by the name of Ella Louise Fortune was driving by Holloman Air Force Base and saw this glowing cigar-shaped object was moving pretty quickly, leaving a contrail behind it. She had a camera with her. She quickly uh, took a photograph of this object. It's now a very famous photo. And this is how this incident really, that was sort of the pre-show for what was about to happen. Because uh, following this weird stuff started to happen. Uh, October 30th, about two weeks later, a man was driving through Casper, Wyoming, when he came upon a UFO right in the road, uh, he wanted to turn around, pull a U-turn, and get away from this thing, but he couldn't because his engine failed, and he was stuck there in his car. He said it was very scary, and finally this object takes off, and his engine works again, and he, he pulls the U-turn and, <laughs> and gets away. Uh, really kind of ramped up one day after that, November 1st, 6.20 a.m., a secretary who is a resident of the Sandia Mountains in New Mexico saw a glowing red cigar-shaped object. Uh, November 2nd, in the town of Canadian, Texas, this is not far away from Leveland, uh, a car came, was driving along when a UFO approached and their headlights went out. Uh, same day, November 2nd, a witness was driving through Amarillo, Texas, when a UFO approached and his car engine failed. Same day, November 2nd, four oil crewmen, J.A. Criswell and Bobby Black and two others, saw a very large glowing red object hovering over the, uh, their crew site. Uh, J. Criswell said it was as big as the full moon and probably about 200 feet high. Bobby Black, a, a much younger man, said, it scared the hound dog out of me. I thought the world was coming to end. So after hovering briefly, it darts away. So this is when it really starts to get busy, the evening of November 2nd. On around 8 p.m., Otis Eccles, 
owner of a radio station KCLV in the town of Clovis, New Mexico, saw an unidentified yellow glowing object traveling at high speed over the town. About a half hour later, 8.30 p.m., an anonymous motorist was driving through the town of Seminole when a glowing unidentified light swooped down from the sky ahead of him on the road, dove at his car, causing it to stall briefly, and his headlights failed. The subject then rises up and zooms off into the distance. It was about two hours later when things really <laughs> started to hit the fan. Uh, it was 10.15 or 10.50 p.m. or 11.15, somewhere around there, November 2nd, Pedro Saucedo and his friend Jose Salas were driving along Route 116, Route 116, about four miles south of Leveland, Texas, uh, when they saw this glowing object, and it made a beeline for their car and just swooped over it. I'll quote Pedro here. This is what Pedro Saucedo said. We didn't think much about it, but then it rose out of the field and started toward us, picking up speed. When it got nearer, the lights of my truck went out and the motor died. I jumped out and hit the deck as the thing passed over my truck with a great sound and a rush of wind. It sounded like thunder, and my truck rocked from the blast. It was so rapid and quite some heat that I had to hit the ground. It also had colors, yellow, white, and it looked like a torpedo about 200 feet long, moving at an estimated 200 or 600 to 800 miles per hour. So what is going on here? Things had just begun. Uh, let's see, it was about 5, 10, maybe 15 minutes later, two air traffic controllers at Amarillo, Texas Airport see a glowing blue object move swiftly across the sky. Uh, less than half an hour later, 11.50 p.m., just before midnight, Jim Wheeler is also driving along Route 116, same road as uh, Pedro Saucedo and Jose Salas, and he encounters this egg-shaped object which was landed in the middle of the road in front of him. Uh, uh, as he gets close, his headlights and his car engine died. Uh, like Pedro Saucedo and Jose Salas, he called the police. Uh, just before midnight, around the same time, Jose Alvarez is driving along Route 51 outside of Levelin when his car dies and a UFO appears. He also calls the police. A uh, married couple uh, and their children were driving on State Road 1073 when a bright object passed overhead, causing their radio and their headlights to go out and the car engine to stall. It was around midnight, 10 minutes later, Newell Wright, a student at Texas Tech, was driving along Route 116 again when his car died. He didn't see anything, so he gets out of his car, opens the hood, is checking the engine. Nothing appears to be wrong. He closes the hood, turns around because he senses something, and gets a real shock. There's a 100-foot-long glowing green-blue object right there in front of him on the road. He jumps in the car, but the car is still not working. The object, which is totally silent, rises upward and takes off. Fifteen minutes later, it's now November 3rd, uh, Frank Williams of Witherall, Texas, not far away, comes upon a glowing object, landed on the road. It's always landed on the road, <laughs> right in front of these people, blocking the road. Uh, his engine and headlights both die. The object is pulsating, and his headlights actually light up in time with the way this object is pulsating. And then it takes off. So by this time, the police in Leveland have re received a flood of calls. They estimate at least 15 or 20 uh, of people reporting this thing. So the officers decide they're going to go out and investigate and see what's going on. There's three of them, Officer Spowler, Offer, Officer McCulloch, Officer Weir Clem, all take off in their cruisers to see if they can find what's going on. Meanwhile, their activity is still going on <laughs> full force, 12.45 a.m. Ronald Martin is driving his truck when he sees a glowing object approaching. It's about a mile away at this point. 
makes a beeline for him and lands right in front of him on the road, <laughs> blocking his passage. It's egg-shaped, it's 200 feet long, and uh, once again, his entire electrical system in his car goes completely dead, and his engine dies. So, <laughs> same thing keeps happening here. Some t around the same time, uh, 12.45, 1 a.m., 1.30 perhaps, James Long is driving along, and he describes exactly the same thing. A large, glowing, egg-shaped object. It's landed on a side street. His car engine fails, and so does his entire electrical system until this object leaves. So now, I mean, Sheriff Weir and McCulloch and the others are driving around at 1.30 a.m. They actually see this object in front of them on the road. Uh, it moves very fast, like a streak of light. It's shining some sort of beam of light down. Uh, here's a little interview from Weir, uh, Officer Weir Clem, about what he saw. Oh, 
Uh, so yeah, a lot of people were seeing this. When uh, we're Clem and his fellow officers were seeing this, there was another group of officers right behind them, a short distance away. They also saw it. Patrolman Lee Hargrove and Floyd Gavin both saw it, as did another police officer, Lloyd Ballin. A uh, short time later, a fire marshal by the name of Ray Jones was driving along, and he saw this object as well, and it caused his car engine to sputter, not completely fail, uh, and the object moved on. So meanwhile, while all this is going on, the object moves over to New Mexico at White Sands. It's now 3 a.m., November 3rd, and Corporal Glenn H. Toy and his fellow officer James Wilbanks are on Army Jeep Patrol at White Sands when they see, quote, a very bright light High in the sky, it's egg-shaped, it's about 100 yards in diameter, descends to about 100 feet, get this, right over the old atomic bunker that was first used in the first atomic explosions. After a few moments, it blinks out. A few minutes later, it flares up again. And they said it was nearly as bright as the sun, and then descends toward the ground in what they felt was a controlled landing and disappeared. They sent out a search party, but no trace was found. Eleven hours later, uh, this is still, let's see, November 3rd. It's now just before 2 p.m. A test pilot is flying from Texas to Roswell, New Mexico, and he's coming in for a landing at Holloman Air Force Base and lands and tells base operations that he just encountered a large oblong glowing object which passed right over his aircraft moving so quickly that it left kind of a streak of light. So this was going on not only in Texas and New Mexico but really all over the world. Uh, we don't know how many cases exactly because once again most people do not report their sightings. Uh, but that same evening uh, there was a gentleman driving all the way up in Calgary, in Canada, uh, had a UFO closely approach him, causing his car to fail. Uh, around 6 p.m. that same evening, military police at White Sands again see another UFO. They describe it as brilliant, vermilion in color, about 300 feet in diameter, and it's hovering over White Sands range there. At the same time, a nearby resident in Deming, New Mexico, so she sees a strange glowing object whizzing overhead. So that's 6 p.m. <laughs> two hours later, 8 p.m., uh, two military officers, Forrest R. Oaks and Officer Barlow, were on another two-man team, an Army Jeep patrol at White Sands, when they saw another glowing object hovering over the test base, right over the old atomic bunker again. 
And according to Officer Oaks, it was about 200, maybe 300 feet long, very bright. He estimates it was about two miles away when this object ascends at a 45 degree angle. The lights are pulsating on and off. It's moving pretty slowly, sometimes stopping, but then scooting upwards again, fa farther and farther upwards until it was had the appearance of a bright star. Uh, went upwards even farther until it was a tiny pinpoint of light. And they again felt that this was a controlled vehicle. So there is an interview from the uh, officer at White Sands about this incident and the incident involving Glenn Toy and the other officers. I just want to play a short clip of that. It's just a few minutes long, but very interesting. Here's a report just received on an additional sighting by two soldiers at White Sands, New Mexico. This is Bill Haggard, public information officer of White Sands Proving Ground, New Mexico. Three young uh, military policemen who spotted a mysterious object over White Sands Proving Ground Sunday agreed here tonight that uh, what they saw looked like a landing and takeoff of some controlled uh, object from outer space. Uh, in open session, uh, here with the public information and intelligence officials, the youth pieced together a startling tale of what appeared to be a movement of a uh, uh, patrol device. Uh, working on two ships and routine patrol in the dark range area, the soldiers said they had not talked with each other about what they saw until after both reports had been turned into the Provo Marshal's office. This means further that uh, prior to their sighting of the object, they read no newspaper accounts or heard anything about mysterious objects elsewhere. Uh, the youth emphasized uh, that uh, the object looked as bright as the sky, uh, bright as the sun rather, but it did not light the sky around it. Uh, the Corporal Glenn H. Toy, who with his buddy uh, PFC James Wilbanks, saw the object first about 3 a.m. Sunday. He told him noticing a mysterious ball of the sky. The object uh, came down very slowly to about 50 yards from the ground, the Corporal said. And, uh, it stayed up there for three minutes, just giving off the brilliant reddish light. Then it came to the ground fairly fast, at about a 45 degree angle, and the light went out quickly. Uh, uh, this was about two or three miles away from me. It looked like a completely controlled landing. Uh, Will Banks, who had been on a three-day pass, not present the interview, his pass had been approved some days previously. The other two MPs, uh, Specialist Third Class Richard Oak, Specialist Third Class Henry Marlow, spotted uh, what appeared to be the same object some 17 hours later, about 8 p.m. Sunday, when they were on patrol together in the Jeep. They say they first noticed the object hovering motionless about 50 yards from the ground, and then saw it rise uh, slowly into the sky and stop again. Uh, it got so far up, finally, that it looked like a star. I said, oh, then all of a sudden, we didn't see it anymore. Uh, I know it couldn't have been an aircraft, uh, said Marlowe, because it remained motionless for several minutes. Uh, the second patrol also died, saw the object from uh, since about two miles in about the same area. Uh, the, the patrols possibly were about a mile apart. Uh, the terrain at the northern end of the northern tip of the range, 90 miles north of uh, White Sands Proving Ground Headquarters, uh, is near the bunkers used in the first atomic bomb explosion in 1945. Uh, the terrain is uh, uh, flat desert land. It's possible to see clearly for several miles. I think, I think that covers it. You have just heard a report by the public information officer at White Sands, New Mexico, on a sighting by two soldiers on Sunday morning of an unidentified flying object. So, yeah, I mean, what is going on here? So as November 3rd turns into November 4th, it's now past midnight, uh, there is an airline flying over Brazil 
when a UFO approaches and suddenly their direction finder and their transmitter fail. And when they're examined, they show traces of being burned. Uh, same evening at Fort Itapu in Sao Vicente, Brazil, there was a very scary and very concerning UFO incident in which these objects hovered right over the military fort there, causing a complete electrical failure and the sentries, the guards who were patrolling the base, were struck by beams of light from this object, which caused injuries, severe burns on both of them. So th this is serious stuff and going all over the world. It's not just level in Texas or uh, you know, outside New Mexico, like a lot of people believe. This is worldwide. Uh, that same evening, November 4th, Elmwood Park, Illinois, a police officer encounters a UFO and starts chasing it, at which point his headlights fail and his police spotlight starts to dim and t you know, brown out. Uh, same evening, November 4th, we're now up at Toronto, Canada. Uh, residents started noticing interference on their television, went outside and saw a UFO. So by this time, the media has caught wind of these incidents. The news is going crazy. Uh, and uh, many articles are being written about this. Uh, this is causing quite an uproar. Folks in Level Land, Texas, are worried about strange objects in their neighborhood. Sheriff Weir Clem says he has received several reports of a strange egg-shaped object about 200 feet long landing on farms and highways last night in the vicinity of Level Land. Sheriff Clem says he even himself got a glimpse of the thing which somehow turned off lights and auto engines when it came near. The sheriff says that lights and engines worked fine again after the thing went away. This is Bob Pierpoint in Washington. So it's now still, you know, November 4th, but now we're in the afternoon. It's at 1.10 p.m. And one of the most famous incidents involving this whole wave of sightings occurs to an officer by the name of James Stokes. He's an officer at Holloman Air Force Base. He's a high altitude missile engineer, a Navy veteran. In other words, a trained observer, a great witness. He's driving along the side of a uh, White Sands Proving Grounds. There's several other cars around him, at least 10, when suddenly all of them, all their car engines fail. All at once, they all roll to a stop, and uh, there is this huge object. Some of the people are getting out of their car and pointing at it. It's approaching from the northeast. Stokes leans out of his car and sees this glowing, pearlescent, egg-shaped object. He said of huge proportions. Uh, it was no higher than 300, maybe 500 feet, performing all these incredible maneuvers. He saw no visible portholes, no external features at all. It passed overhead at least twice, sending down strong waves of heat. It dives down very low, is making sharp turns, moving sometimes at an estimated 2,500 miles per hour. So I'll just just let Stokes, uh, Sergeant S James Stokes, describe what he saw in his own words. I saw a brilliant egg-shaped object making a shallow dive across the sky. Then it turned and made a pass at the highway and crossed it not more than two miles ahead. Then it moved twor away towards white sand proving grounds. As it passed, I could feel a kind of heat wave, like radiation from a giant sun lamp. There was no sound and no visible portholes. When I got to my car and checked the engine, I found it intact, but the battery was steamy. So yeah, other witnesses were located uh, to this incident. Uh, there was a uh, officer, another officer at a uh, Holloman Air Force Base at White Sands Proving Ground, who apparently saw it uh, and took photographs of it, uh, though these have not been publicly revealed. Uh, he said that the clouds and the mist would dissipate as this object moved through it. Uh, Stokes, by the way, following this incident, discovered that he had received a sunburn on his face. It was this incident and others that were the inspiration for 
that famous scene involving Richard Dreyfuss in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind by uh, Steven Spielberg. So Stokes uh, is a good officer and reports his sighting to his military superior at Hallam and Air Force Base. They tell him initially that it's all right to talk publicly about it. They request a physical examination, uh, which he undergoes. Uh, Stokes goes public. He's interviewed by Coral and Jim Lorenzen of the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, APRO. Uh, and uh, he was now pretty reticent to discuss his sighting and actually suggested it might be some kind of, quote, atmospheric phenomena. Jim and Coral Lorenzen believe he may have been pressured at this point by his military superiors not to talk about it. Uh, and Coral Lorenzen said that uh, he may have changed his story because of this. They met with him two months later after this other interview, after his story had been widely printed in newspapers. And in some cases, he had been viciously attacked, attacked as a hoaxer. And he told the Lorenzans that he was quite upset about the hoax accusations and said if he ever saw anything out of the ordinary again, he, would, he wouldn't tell anyone, uh, which is truly unfortunate because we, we hear this from police officers all the time, that they have to keep things secret uh, for their own reputation. In a taped interview on KLG Radio, Sergeant James Stokes did say that what he saw was, quote, definitely a solid object, but he refused to elaborate, saying, I just hope we're ready for whatever it is. So interestingly, Air Force Public Information Officer Lieutenant Colonel John McCurdy at the Missile Development Center uh, did reveal that he questioned Stokes extensively about the incident and was in fact convinced that Stokes had in fact had a genuine sighting. Uh, so yeah, there was other officers who saw this. Uh, Jim and Cora Lorenzen learned about an officer at Holloman who saw it. Apparently there was also a, a nurse at a local hospital who, quote, knew a couple on the highway near Oro Grande when, the en when that engineer, Stokes, saw that saucer. Uh, but the couple refused to come forward because they saw how Stokes had been treated in the press, but they told the nurse that the thing they saw was definitely a machine of some kind and not a natural phenomena, as some newspapers have reported. So yeah, Stokes' Stokes's case was definitely front page news. Here's a little news story about what he saw. Reports keep coming in of a mysterious, brilliant object being sighted in areas of New Mexico and Texas. The latest report is from James Stokes, an engineer from the Air Force Missile Development Center at Holloman Air Force Base in Alamogordo, New Mexico. He has told of seeing a brilliant colored egg-shaped object yesterday, and he's quoted as saying some force emanating from it stalled ten cars on an isolated desert road between White Sands Proving Grounds and Alamogordo. Uh, Stokes also told Terry Clark, the news director of a radio station in Alamogordo, that as the object passed in a shallow dive across the sky, he could feel a kind of a heat wave, like radiation from a giant sun lamp. But he said he heard no sound. Earlier reports in recent days told of a big ball of fire spotted over much of West Texas. The Air Force is investigating. And now the news from the United States. The Air Force apparently is convinced that an electronics engineer actually saw an unidentified flying object over the New Mexico desert. The engineer who works at the Air Force's White Sands Missile Proving Grounds said the egg-shaped object with rings around it was spotted at the same time as his car and ten others were mysteriously stalled Monday. A spokesman said the Air Force is trying to locate other motorists whose cars are set by Stokes to have stalled. So meanwhile, I mean, this is still November 4th. There are sightings still going on all over the world. Kodiak, Alaska. A police officer sees a UFO close up and his radio fails. Uh, same evening, it's around 7 p.m., Miss Van Fleet 
is in her home in New Mexico. When she sees a gold-colored object, she says it's larger than the full moon. It's hovering at about 45 degree elevation in the western sky for at least five minutes. About a half hour later, a border inspector in El Paso uh, was driving through El Paso when his car stalled. He got out and saw a giant blue egg-shaped object approaching from quite some distance. Uh, goes directly, makes a beeline for his car, passes right overhead at about 100 feet, moves off, at which point his car now works. Uh, a few hours later, 10.45 p.m., this same UFO, multiple UFOs, is back. This time it's over Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. And they're able to track this thing on radar. Controllers are on duty in the 100-foot high airport tower at Kirtland Air Force Base and are tracking this thing. And this case made it to Project Blue Book. Uh, and they, s Blue, Blue Book officers uh, said that the controllers saw, quote, a white light traveling east between 150 and 200 miles per hour at an altitude of approximately 1,500 feet. They called the radar station, which confirmed that they had it on radar, uh, that it was at the east end of runway 26 and moving in a southwesterly direction before beginning a steep descent. So the controllers grab a pair of binoculars and actually see this thing. They said it was definitely a vehicle. It reminded them of an automobile standing up on end. According to the Blue Book report, this was this object it was about 15 to 18 feet uh, high. It had one, light, one white light on the lower side. It was slowed down at some point to about 50 miles per hour, disappeared behind a fence in a very restricted area, which, by the way, was brilliantly lit with floodlights. Uh, this is just about a half mile from the actual control tower itself. At this point, the object reappears. It's now about 200, 300 feet, and they're still wondering, could this be a helicopter or a plane in distress? And uh, according to the Blue Book, this is what they said. Although completely cooperative and willing to answer any questions, both sources appeared to be slightly embarrassed that they could not identify or offer an explanation of the object, which they are unshakably convinced they saw. So, you know, while this object is being tracked on radar, it's, it's being seen, it's going over at a very low altitude over Kirtland Air Force Base. It's obviously controlled and uh, lasts for about five minutes and uh, reappeared a number of times. Uh, in fact, during this incident, at some point it reappeared and uh, it was flying at a high rate of speed about a mile south of the east-west runway where it made an abrupt turn to the west and started to follow a C-46 aircraft that was ha had taken off. So it follows this C-46 plane uh, from a half mile behind it or so for the next 14 miles. And they're again tracking this on radar uh, for about you know, 20 minutes. Uh, before it finally fades from the scope. So yeah, this was investigated by Project Blue Book, and Project Blue Book's conclusion uh, was that this was probably a plane and that the controllers were just unable to identify it. J. Allen Hynek uh, learned about this incident, and he was pretty much uh, in shock at Blue Book's conclusion. He couldn't believe it and uh, disagreed because uh, here's what the uh, officers at Blue Book said, that this may possibly have been an unidentified aircraft, possibly confused by the runways at Kirtland Air Force Base. The reasons for this opinion are, one, the observers are considered competent and reliable sources, and in the opinion of this interviewer, the Blue Book officer, actually saw an object that they could not identify, Two, the object was tracked on a radar scope by a competent operator. And three, the object does not meet identification criteria for any other phenomena. So they're basically saying it's a plane, but the officers couldn't identify it. And Hynek was absolutely exasperated by this. And here's what he says about this incident. That is, the observers, reliable, 
the radar operator was competent and the object couldn't be identified, therefore it was an airplane. In the face of such reasoning, one might well ask whether it would ever be possible to discover the existence of new empirical phenomena in any area of human experience. What indeed can we say of a radar visual case like this? The basic agreement of the radar and visual reports and the competence of the three observers, in my opinion, rules out questions of mirage, false returns on radar, etc. Something quite definitely was there. If it was an ordinary aircraft, one must ask how it was that the two visual observers with a total of 23 years of control tower experience could jointly not have been able to recognize it when visibility conditions were good. Even if there were no radar confirmation of the slow and fast motions of the object, or indeed just of the presence of an unknown object, this question would still have to be answered. The description of the object's appearance through binoculars, like an auto on end, would also demand explanation. So yeah, <laughs> Blue Book was neck deep and having a lot of trouble dealing with this. They got a lot of uh, negative feedback from their handling and their mishandling rather of this incident. So this was causing waves at this point in very high levels of government and was just causing a meteor circus. Uh, and it was still going on. Uh, at 4.24 a.m. on November 5th, 1957, Don Clark, he's an electronics and radar technician employed by a s as a civilian contractor at Holloman Air Force Base. Uh, he was in his home east of Alamogordo when he saw an orange-red cigar-shaped object hovering at about 15 degrees elevation in the western sky directly over Holloman. He ran to get his camera, but by when he returned, the object was gone. Five minutes later, Lyman Brown Jr. is in his home in Alamogordo, and he sees a yellow-orange light at about 45 degrees moving quickly to the east, and it winks out over the San Sacramento Mountains. Seconds later, he sees a very bright searchlight where this object had been looping around. So, yes, on November 5th, at Fo Fort Oglethorpe, people were inside their home when their TV blacked out and they went outside and saw this object hovering outside. Same day in Headley, Texas, same thing happened. People watching TV, TV goes out, they go outside, and it's a UFO. Uh, November 5th, same night, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. People are in their apartment. When the lights go out, the apartment it fills with a flash of light. Uh, their electric clock stops, and uh, they're, they're awakened by this whole incident. And uh, yeah, it's another UFO affecting electromagnetic instruments. So another incident, same evening, 7.30 p.m., El Paso, Texas. Cars driving through the city when the, the car stalled and the lights go out. 15 minutes later, 7.45 p.m., a bus driver, Delbert Boyd, is driving about five miles southwest of Albuquerque uh, when he sees a mysterious light. It's flaring up in brilliance and becoming dim and eventually appears to land right outside the city. Uh, 45 minutes later or so, 8.30, in Hobbs, New Mexico, a car is driving and uh, their engine and headlights fail as this UFO comes swooping down over the car. A few minutes later, same exact, exact thing happens to another person uh, driving again through Hobbs, New Mexico. Uh, their engine fails and their car headlights go out. Uh, same evening in Ringwood, Illinois, a couple was followed home by a UFO. It darts off, they go inside, they're watching TV, and uh, their TV fails, they go outside, the UFO is back. Uh, another case, same night, this, but this is in Springfield, Ohio. A cab driver and a car were driving along when a UFO showed up and both their cars stalled simultaneously. 9.30 p.m., same evening, back in San Antonio, Texas, uh, people are driving along and they see this UFO hovering over a field at a very low level. Suddenly the engine quits, their radio goes out, and the headlights dim. So yeah, the 
media is still going crazy over this. There's all kinds of news stories. It's causing very high waves at high levels of military and government. They're not quite sure how to deal with this. Uh, initially, they're calling it ball lightning. And Hynek actually agreed with this at first. Uh, when he heard about the Loveland sightings, uh, he agreed that, yeah, it's probably ball lightning. But he would later retract his statement. Uh, so, yeah, November 5th, it's crazy. Uh, that evening, uh, there was another incident in Pell City, Alabama, where a driver came upon a UFO causing his car to stall. Uh, it was later that same day, it was just after midnight, so it's now November 6, 1.15 a.m., uh, Santa Fe residents J. Martinez and A. Gallegos were driving their car when they saw an egg-shaped object with red, green, and yellow lights approaching them at a very low altitude. It was moving very slowly, and like all these other cases, it comes directly over their car, illuminating, illuminating the entire area around it. It was a great glow all over, is what they said. At the same time, they did hear a very loud humming noise, and as soon as this object is directly overhead, their car engine dies. Both their clocks and wristwatches also stopped functioning. Object is there for just a second hovering and then darts off to the southwest and disappears. Uh, a couple of hours later, same uh, evening or early morning, actually, it's 4.30 a.m. Now, we're now in Houston, Texas. A gentleman is driving through Houston when his car fails and his radio becomes all staticky and a UFO appears and swoops over his car. <laughs> I don't know what this UFO is doing, uh, but it clearly has this uh, agenda of turning car engines off. So uh, later that day, uh, it was around 6.15 p.m. now, an anonymous tourist is going through Tucumcari, New Mexico, and he calls the police and reports this huge red object that's hovering just outside of Vaughn on US Highway 54. That same evening, two residents from Santa Fe called the police to report a huge ball of fire that was traveling in a southwest trajectory as they drove towards Santa Fe. Uh, but again, all over the world, Danville, Illinois, a uh, police officer saw a UFO and gave chase to it and it caused their radio to malfunction and they weren't able to report what they were seeing back to their station. In Montville, Ohio, people ran outside because their TV was acting very strangely and sure enough, there was this UFO hovering. Back up to Ottawa, Canada. A uh, guy who is a radio technician has a radio a uh, normal radio and a shortwave radio, both failed as a UFO hovered over his home. Uh, another case occurred the next day on November 8th, or let's see, November 7th at 1.45 a.m. So it's just, what, eight, just a few hours later after the above case, five people, five airmen, Bradford Ricketts, James Cole, Dennis Murphy, Wayne Hurlbert, and Harry Ulrich were on duty at a salvage yard on the north side of the base when uh, they observed a cigar-shaped object moving overhead. They said it made a strange whistling noise and changed from white to orange to red. So same evening, now we're in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Cars driving along when a UFO swoops down causing the car electrical system and engine to completely fail. Seven hours later, another really major case. This one had some very strange effects. This is in the morning, 9.20 a.m., a daylight sighting, November 7th, outside of Oro Grande. This is just 20 miles from where St James Stokes has had his encounter. A couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Trent Lindsay and their 22-year-old son, Byron, were driving south on Highway 54, Byron, Byron, their son, was the first to notice that the speedometer on their 1954 Mercury was behaving very strangely. Even though he was driving a steady speed, 
the stick on the dial started to weave erratically back and forth from about 60 miles per hour, the speed they were actually traveling, going upward to 110 miles per hour, uh, which was not accurate. They weren't overly concerned at this point. Uh, they didn't see any objects. They only noticed this weird effect on their speedometer. And uh, we're talking about it and trying to figure out what the cause could be when suddenly they see this strange object in the southwest sky. And I'll just quote Byron Lindsay about what happened next. According to Byron Lindsay, and I'm quoting here, the needle kept skipping back and forth between 60 and 110 miles per hour and making a clattering sound. While the needle was jumping around, Dad pointed towards the southwest and said, I suppose you think that is something. And it was something. It was cylindrical in shape, silvery, and moving. We traveled some 15 miles before the speedometer corrected itself, and we had no trouble during the rest of the trip. Strangely, the needle kept wavering to the side where the object was instead of towards the zero mark on the speedometer. Uh, according to Byron Lindsay, the object was highly polished metal in appearance with sharply defined edges, had no visible means of propulsion, uh, no controls or lights or glows or anything that he could see, and was moving in kind of an arcing trajectory towards the Oregon Mountains to the southwest. So by this time, there were so many sightings being reported that although the Air Force tried to debunk them, uh, documents now clearly show that they were not only aware of these sightings, uh, contrary to their official <laughs> statements, uh, they were taking these reports extremely seriously. On November 7, 1957, an article from the El Paso Times printed the following editorial, and I'm quoting, Some of the nation's top scientists are pretty shook up about the mysterious flying objects sighted in New Mexico and West Texas skies this week, said Charles Capon, a scientist at White Sands. This is something that hasn't happened before. And it's not over yet. Two days later, 7.20 p.m., a Tula Rosa, New Mexico housewife, uh, this is uh, November 9th, a college student and several others observed a large, brilliant, fast-moving light which approached their car very closely on U.S. Highway 54. This is about 70 miles north of Alamogordo. And it caused their vehicle's entire lighting system to fail. The object approached from the south, flew directly over the car, then changed course to the southwest, accelerating at high speed off into the distance. At the same time as this setting was going on, investigators Jim and Coral Lorenzen were in the area. They were traveling east on Highway 3 380, about 10 miles from Carriozo, New Mexico, when they became witnesses, they saw, quote, a brilliant, or rather a bright light silhouetted against the mountains to the east and which moved erratically until it appeared to move south. So this is crazy. Next day, it continued. November 10th, 7.50 p.m., another car stalling case at Sweetwater, Texas, uh, when this UFO appro approached at a very low altitude right over a vehicle. About one hour later in Car Cariozo, New Mexico, UFO approached over a car. The engine uh, remained running, but the car headlights uh, dimmed and failed. So by this point, the Air Force is getting pretty upset over all the publicity of some of their officers. And after this wave of sightings and media coverage, the following item was published in the official section of the Holloman Daily Bulletin which, by the way, is mandatory reading for all base personnel, both military and civilian. And I'm quoting now. The title of the uh, memo is Unidentified Flying Objects. And here's how it reads. On November 7, six airmen claimed they sighted an unidentified flying object and did not report this to proper base authorities. They did, however, give this information to the local press 
request that each member of the military and civilian employed at this center refrain from any public statement on political, diplomatic, legislative, or scientific matters or any controversial subjects such as UFOs without first contacting the Center Information Services Officer. This request is in accordance with AFR 190-6. Disciplinary action may be taken against the offender. Signed, Lieutenant Colonel McCurdy. So, yeah, n they not only knew ab about this and were no longer being forthcoming, they were trying to cover it up. Uh, Coral Lorenzen heard about this, and sh this regulation, she says, and I'm quoting, restricts individuals at Air Force installations in relating details of UFO sightings, and this regulation is a violation of the constitutional rights of civilians and should be challenged. The uh, Air Force radar network is watching for strange flying objects reported in various sections of the country. The Air Force alerted its radar installations after sightings of unidentified flying objects were reported in the Gulf of Mexico, Texas, and the Missile Test Center in New Mexico and in other areas of the country. Unidentified flying objects, round, cigar-shaped, and star-like were reported across vast areas of the United States today. A grain buyer in Kearney, Nebraska, said he talked with six occupants of a transparent spaceship last night. Officers investigating the report found impressions in the earth corresponding to a landing gear and footsteps where the incident was alleged to have taken place. Near Knoxville, Tennessee, a 12-year-old farm boy said he saw a long, round spaceship land near his home and two men and two women got up. Two newsmen checking the report found a weird imprint in the ground. It was in the shape of a fat cigar or slender egg some 24 feet long. Elsewhere across the nation, persons reported seeing objects flying through space, whisking along the ground, or just sitting still. Some were trapped by radar. So yeah, Blue Book, you know, after this was all over, uh, it, it, tr it trailed down pretty quickly following this first week in November. There was a few more scattered incidents, uh, mostly in Texas and New Mexico, but yeah, all over the world but slowed down dramatically to the rate it was, which is just one or two car stalling cases every now and then. Uh, Blue Book originally called this ball lightning, and Hynek did as well. And as I s mentioned earlier, retracted the statement. I'd like to read a little quote by J. Allen Hynek, because it's definitely worth listening to. And here is Hynek talking. Hynek is, was, of course, the astronomical consultant at this time for Project Blue Book. Uh, he later sa gave this statement. I am not proud today that I concurred with Captain Gregory's evaluation as ball lightning on the basis of information that an electrical storm had been in progress in the Leveland area at the time. This was shown not to be the case. Observers reported overcast and mist, but no lightning. Besides, have I give, given it any thought whatever, I would have soon recognized the absence of any evidence that ball lightning can stop cars and put out headlights. So yeah, he now believes this was obviously an unexplained type of incident. Uh, this is a very interesting case because there were so many landings. And apparently, yeah, there were some cases of landing traits. One lady by the name of Carolyn Reno who lived in Leveland at that time, she was 10 years old, said that her father uh, took her to a lo location at the edge of town, someone somewhere between Leveland and Lubbock, Texas, and uh, where there was a pasture where there was no buildings nearby, and they came upon an area of scorched grass, round in shape and about 15 feet across. Uh, and this was confirmed by her mother as well. So I first became interested in this whole wave of sightings when I wrote uh, my book, UFOs Over New Mexico, and discovered this incredible wave of sightings in the first week of November. At the time, I didn't realize how extensive it was. And honestly, I didn't re realize until I started doing research for this video here. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we've just touched the tip of the iceberg. Blue Book received like 50 reports uh, in this month. 
And you have to remember, you can probably times that by 10 or 100, because 1 in 10, maybe 1 in 100 people report their sighting. So it was a lot more than that. And this, again, is completely unprecedented. While there have been a lot of electromagnetic effect cases, nothing like this has ever happened before. Before this incident, investigators previously thought that electromagnetic failures were sort of a byproduct of UFOs flying over. Uh, perhaps it was the, the engines from the UFO uh, making a side effect and causing machines to fail. And now a lot of people began to speculate perhaps that this is not the case at all, and that these stallings, these electrical interferences were intentional and maybe not a weapon, but sort of a beam of some kind or intentionally done. Uh, we can really only speculate, uh, but I think there is probably some truth to this simply because UFO electromagnetic effects, while not rare, are not common either. Um, the vast majority of UFO sightings, even close-up ones involving vehicles being chased down the road, do not involve electromagnetic effects. And yeah, people have objects hovering right over their car, and their engine is fine, and so are their headlights. <laughs> so what is going on here? Is this intentional? You know, why are they doing this? Why are they landing in front of the road, blocking passage? Why are they causing headlights to fail, car engines to fail, affecting planes, affecting speedometers, watches, televisions, radios of all kinds? Uh, yeah, I do feel like this was intentional. Uh, I, it's got to be more than one object, but as the UFO flies, <laughs> I mean, they can be all over the planet uh, wherever they want in seconds. So it's very hard to say, but it appears as if uh, there was some sort of agenda. A UFO fleet came down and decided to just play these cat and mouse games for a week or a week and a half first week of November 1957. Uh, we don't know why it was so thickly concentrated in a couple of areas, Leveland and New Mexico mostly, but it, again, it was worldwide. It could be because of the atomic testing and all the rocketry going on at White Sands, uh, but there's nothing like that going on in Leveland. Leveland was just a little town of like eight, ten thousand 10,000 people. It's still a little town. <laughs> so it's really hard to say. There was a very famous incident some years earlier, 1952, uh, in nearby Lubbock, Texas, uh, which also got a lot of publicity. There's a very famous photograph of this object as it hovers over Lubbock, Texas. Uh, that could be a factor, but yeah, we don't really know why. There's a lot of questions surrounding this incident. Uh, could it have been a display of power? Is there a message there? We really don't know. But it's clearly a very important event, a very strange event, and unique in UFO history. And for that reason, uh, I think it deserves a lot more attention. And yeah, whatever exactly <laughs> happened on this first week of November 1952, it deserves to be remembered. So thanks once again for watching, and keep having fun.